And good morning, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. So glad you're streaming with us this morning. A national emergency declared in Canada. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau invoking the rare powers for the first time in 50 years. Freezing bank accounts, seizing vehicles, all part of the push to paralyze the protests and protesters. At least one person dead as authorities search for the wreckage of a single-engine plane crash off the coast of North Carolina. Three separate debris fields, the search for the body of the plane, and seven other missing passengers. Gunmaker Remington Arms agreeing to a settlement with families of the victims killed in the 2012 Sandy Hook massacre, marking the first time a gun manufacturer is held accountable for a mass shooting in the United States. But we begin with the major developments this morning, possible diplomacy and de-escalation between Russia and Ukraine. Russia saying it is pulling some troops back from the border, but Ukrainian officials say they'll believe it when they see it. Senior national correspondent Terry Moran is in Ukraine with the latest for us. That dramatic announcement from the Kremlin. Some Russian forces are pulling back from Ukraine's border, heading back to their bases. Russian media today showing tanks loading up on transport. This, after Vladimir Putin, in a carefully choreographed appearance with his foreign minister, said diplomatic efforts to resolve the crisis should continue. But with as many as 150,000 Russian ground forces still near the Ukrainian border, tensions here remain high. The Russian military continues conducting massive drills across the border surrounding Ukraine. Hold on including these aerial drills conducted over Belarus, just north of Ukraine. The Pentagon warning that over the last several days, Putin has actually added to his military capabilities along the border. He continues to advance um, his readiness should he choose to, um, to go down a military uh, path here. Should he choose to invade again, he is doing all the things you would expect him to do to make sure he's ready for that option. Citing the Russian threat here, the U.S. has closed its embassy in Kiev and removed remaining personnel to the western Ukrainian city of Lviv, staff destroying classified material and equipment. Today, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin travels to the region to meet with his NATO counterparts and reaffirm U.S. support, while Russia accuses the U.S. of hysteria. President Zelensky of Ukraine has declared tomorrow a national day of solidarity here. He wants everyone to fly the Ukrainian flag. And at 10 a.m., there is supposed to be a national singing of their national anthem. Everybody out in the streets, out in the squares of the towns and cities singing the national anthem. It is a show of solidarity and of defiance in the face of the Russian threat. Kira? Terry Moran there in Ukraine for us. Thanks, Terry. Let's bring in ABC News national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy for more now. So Mick, NATO saying it is yet to see a real de-escalation. Ukraine's foreign minister saying officials will believe it when they see it. So how long do you think this could take? Well, Kara, the old saying uh, at the time of the Soviet Union was trust but verify. I think now it's more don't trust at all unless you can verify it. And quite frankly, <laughs> the troop movements that they're talking about uh, are easy to reverse. So these troops are stationed relatively close to the border and they can return. Uh, by the contrary, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, logistical uh, troops move forward, uh, which will be needed for a sustained occupation. So I think we're seeing counter evidence to their claim. We should all hope that there is a de-escalization and there isn't a full invasion, but I do not think the White House, the Pentagon, or the CIA will believe it unless they see it with their own information. Sure, just because, you know, history tells the story clearly. And Putin still insisting that his demands be met. However, he did say there were things to discuss, including the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty that former President Trump actually withdrew from and then other military confidence building measures. So how significant do you think that is? And do you believe what he's saying? So I do think it's significant in the sense that he wants to continue this dialogue and diplomatic discussions. Uh, if that leads to a solution that doesn't involve the invasion and occupation of a sovereign country, that's a good thing. Also, if these negotiations continue and just last until spring, it just becomes more and more difficult to launch a full-scale invasion with heavy main tanks and towed artillery and uh, uh, rocket-propelled artillery and, uh, and mechanized infantry. They just don't have the conditions necessary with muddy ground that they do now with hard, frozen ground. So it is good either way if these negotiations continue. 
Okay. And Russia's parliament uh, voting to officially recognize the Russian-controlled separatist regions in eastern Ukraine. We have a correspondent there covering that part of, th of things. But Putin believes that Russia should continue to work on resolving the Ukraine crisis through the Minsk agreement. So what do you make of this? And explain it to those that may not be uh, up on foreign policy. So the Minsk, Minsk agreement re required certain steps to be taken by all parties to this uh, dispute, if you will. Uh, I, it is fair to say that uh, Ukraine hasn't met uh, all of its obligations, but Russia hasn't either. So I don't think it's a bad idea that we're talking about the Minsk agreement. We could go back to, uh, we could actually start, I would say, by implementing the full uh, requirements under that, which talks about troop uh, activities and buildup and all the things that both Russia is concerned about and of course Ukraine and NATO is concerned about. So it would be a good thing if we do actually implement that. But to date, um, neither side is essentially doing that, especially Russia. So uh, if they would, would agree to do it and actually carry it out, that would be a very positive thing. All right, let's talk about the U.S. role for a moment here. ABC News did confirm uh, that a White House team has been carrying out exercises, preparing for a potential invasion, even crafting a playbook for the first two weeks of action. What would that look like, Mick? So, Kira, that was done, that's done often. So anytime there's a significant event or a, a need to have uh, every agency and department in the U.S. government on this, literally on the same sheet of music, they do what's called a playbook. So they go through the scenarios, the most likely scenarios as laid out by the intelligence service, and they get to certain decision points, you know, but based on the actions of your adversary, in this case, Russia, what are our options? And then where do we think we'll go? What, we, what do we think we'll decide? So they can play these out. So they're not having to decide and look at all the factors that go into that during the crisis. So I think it's a, it's a good move by the White House. It's to be expected, but it's something we should do and it will prepare us better in the event that this, this actual invasion kicks off in the near term and we have to react quickly. All right, Mick Mulroy, thank you so much. We'll keep talking, appreciate it. Thank you. We're also talking about skating, steroids, and a scandal that's rocking the Olympics this morning. 15-year-old Russian figure skater Kamila Valieva finished in first place in the women's single skate short program despite testing positive for an illegal performance-enhancing substance. And this is causing a lot of controversy at the Games now. Maggie Ruley has the very latest from inside the bubble. 15-year-old Russian figure skater Kamila Valieva returning to the ice, stumbling during her triple axel, but still pulling off an impressive performance. Coming in first place of the first leg of the women's figure skating competition, hoping to get a gold, despite testing positive for an illegal performance-enhancing substance before the games. The IOC now saying that Valieva claims there was a mix-up with her grandfather's heart medication. I was not in this hearing, and uh, I don't know if uh, the... Uh, her argument was this uh, contamination which uh, uh, happened with a product uh, her grandfather was taking. He presented elements which brought some doubts about uh, her guilt. International court deciding she can still compete while they investigate further. In response, the IOC saying if Valieva lands in the top three, there will be no medals handed out until the investigation is complete. In an interview with Russian TV Channel 1, Valieva is emotional, saying these days have been very difficult, but she's happy she can perform. Many sports critics and athletes are concerned Valieva is just the latest example of blatant disregard for clean sport by Russia, including former Olympic skater Adam Rippon, who won bronze in 2018, and is here at these games coaching American Mariah Bell, who's competing against Valieva in the women's individual event. Is it overshadowing these games, do you think? Totally. This is completely unprecedented that there's an athlete in the competition who's tested positive. It's completely against the moral code of being an Olympian. This ruling has failed the athletes so miserably. Shakari Richardson, the U.S. sprinter and gold medal favorite who tested positive for marijuana and was suspended ahead of last year's summer games, calling out the double standard. The difference is the two countries. If, if USADA, the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, had the Valieva case. So let's say she's an American. The moment that positive test would have come out, they would have told her, you're going home. 
All right, thanks to Maggie Ruley covering everything out of Beijing for us. Now we're talking about taking off the mask. More mandates ending throughout the country. The latest state, California. It's ending its indoor mask mandate for vaccinated individuals, while unvaccinated residents must still wear masks indoors. And then here in D.C., we're lifting our vaccine mandate for indoor venues. Joining me now for more on this and all the changes taking place across the country, Chief Innovation Officer at Boston Children's Hospital and ABC News Medical Contributor Dr. John Brownstein. All right, Doc, if you watch the Super Bowl, a lot of us checked in on it. Uh, you did notice uh, in California there, you didn't see a lot of masks. It's a trend across the country now, according to the FDA commissioner. So it looks like people are maybe thinking this is the right time. We're, we're getting there, Kira. You know, I think that we're getting to a place where we can start to remove the mask. And I think we're much better than we were a month ago. But case levels are still very high. They're still higher than previous peaks. And we still have a situation where many of this population are still unvaxxed, unboosted. And we, of course, you know, as we discussed, the under five population still isn't yet vaccinated. So we have to exercise caution. We have to be nuanced, as, as we've spoken about for many months, and we have to let the data drive decisions. In places with low transmission and high vaccination, yes, we can start to remove masks. But if you're in a place with high transmission, a mask is still an important weapon. So we have to make sure that our decisions are driven by data. And we just all want normal, but we have to recognize that masking still might be important in at least some parts of the country right now. Sure, and pay attention to the science, uh, obviously. And then looking at the bigger picture of this, what do you think of the future of mask and vaccine mandates, um, what it's going to look like as we sort of move toward a possible endemic phase? Yeah, I, I think that we have to acknowledge we're heading to a different place with this virus. We've got the vaccines, the therapeutics, better care. So we're in a better position. So regardless of what happens in the future, I do think masking may be part of what we deal with in the future. Say you have a new variant or a new surge, we may want to bring in masking just to help. I, I think that's a simple thing that we can do alongside testing and potentially the future of vaccines. So, you know, I think we're getting to the place where we can start to, to off-ramp but we should be recognizing the fact that a new variant could change things and we have to be, you know, flexible with what we might see in the future. So possible new variants, is this just going to be a regular, regular thing for us from now on? Well, I think we have to see what happens. I think Omicron definitely exposed so much of the population. There's a lot of immunity out there. I think that we may see that this virus becomes part of that respiratory mix. And so it just becomes part of a flu and cold season. We may want to bring in masking in the future, you know, if we have a real severe season. But we just don't know. You know, Omicron really threw a wrench in our plans. We still potentially have, might have a new variant. So we just have to be recognizing the fact that, you know, things might change. But the, the future is bright because of these therapeutics that are hitting the market and potentially a universal COVID vaccine. I think we are heading to a place where, you know, some of these mandates uh, around masking may not be sort of consistently part of our future. But again, now the, the public is educating about public health and what we can do to, to drive down infection in the community. And so hopefully that stays with us in the future. I think the new mantra is just go with the flow, Dr. Brownstein. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, well, coming Kira. up. You bet. Tennis star Novak Djokovic is speaking out. What he's saying now about his future on the court and the COVID vaccine. We have a bit of breaking news for you out of Great Britain right now. Court documents are showing that Prince Andrew has reached an out-of-court settlement with Virginia Roberts Gouffre, who accused him of sexually assaulting her when she was underage. A letter to the court says that both parties will dismiss the lawsuit when Prince Andrew pays an undisclosed amount of money, making a substantial donation to Gouffre's charity in support of victims' rights. The letter also says that Prince Andrew regrets his association with Jeffrey Epstein and commends the bravery of Miss Gouffre and other survivors in standing up for themselves and others. And new court filings show that gunmaker Remington Arms has agreed to settle liability claims from families of victims who were killed in the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School massacre. The company will pay nine families a total of $73 million. This marks the first time a gun manufacturer has been held to account for a mass shooting in the United States. An attorney for the family said in a press conference earlier, this victory should serve as a wake-up call, not only to the gun industry, but also the insurance and banking companies that prop it up.
Novak Djokovic, the 20-time Grand Slam tennis champ, is now speaking out after he was deported from Australia, saying he's willing to miss more tournaments over the COVID vaccine. Stephanie Ramos has all the details. Tennis superstar Novak Djokovic announcing he will opt out of the upcoming French Open and Wimbledon if it means having to change his stance on the COVID-19 vaccine. That is the price that I'm willing to pay. The 20-time Grand Slam winner faced a firestorm in Australia last month after he arrived to play in the Australian Open without being vaccinated. The government canceled his visa, forcing him out of the tournament. The world's number one player opened up about that experience to the BBC in his first interview since he left Australia. Australia. I understand that uh, and support fully uh, the freedom to choose you know, whether you want to get vaccinated or not. Djokovic's rival, Rafael Nadal, wound up winning this year's Australian Open, giving him one more Grand Slam title than Djokovic. Boycotting two of the year's biggest tournaments could wind up costing Djokovic the title of greatest men's player of all time. But he says that is a price he is willing to pay. Because the principles of uh, decision-making on my body uh, are more important than any title or anything else. I, I'm, I'm trying to be in tune with my body um, as much as I possibly can. He added that he is keeping his mind open about the possibility of being vaccinated in the future. We are all trying to find collectively uh, a best possible solution to end COVID. I was never against uh, uh, vaccination. I understand that globally everyone is trying to put a big effort into handling this virus and, and seeing a, hopefully a, 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 an end soon to this virus. Kira, Djokovic also says he hopes vaccination requirements at certain tournaments will change because he would like to play for many more years. Kira. Stephanie Ramos, all right, thanks so much. Now to that guilty plea from a U.S. naval engineer accused of trying to sell information about nuclear-powered submarines to a foreign government. Our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, is in Washington with more. A nuclear engineer who worked for the U.S. Navy is admitting to spying against his own country and implicating his own wife as a partner in an espionage plot targeting some of the nation's most sensitive submarines. Jonathan Toby telling a federal judge on Monday that I conspired with Diana Toby, his wife, to transmit restricted data to a foreign nation in exchange for payment with the intent to injure the United States. He has told the government his wife's involvement in the case. Now, that can cut two ways. One is that he is doing it so she potentially could get a lesser sentence or that could also work against you because it really depends on how culpable she was. Toby and his wife, a former school teacher, allegedly receiving $100,000 for classified information about the Virginia class of nuclear submarines, which used sophisticated stealth technology. The alleged plot involved secret drop-off locations with Toby and his wife allegedly hiding the classified information in a variety of ways, including in a peanut butter sandwich and a chewing gum package. Neighbors told ABC News they were always suspicious. We'd have, you know, holiday parties. All of us are in our driveways having bonfires, and they never came out, never joined in. The FBI discovered the alleged plot and set up a sting after Toby sent a package of materials to an unidentified foreign country with instructions for how to establish a covert relationship to purchase restricted information. This morning, it's unclear how Toby's plea affects his wife, who has pled not guilty. Her attorneys had initially suggested that the FBI had limited evidence pointing to her having direct knowledge of the scheme. Kira? All right, our... Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Pierre, thank you. And there's a major development in the investigation of former President Donald Trump's business empire for possible fraud. The Trump Organization's longtime accounting firm has now cut its ties with his company, declaring that key financial documents should no longer be relied upon. Chief Washington Correspondent John Carl has the latest. 
Former President Donald Trump's accounting firm has cut ties with its highest profile client as he faces civil and criminal investigations into his family business. In the past, Trump has described his accountants as the best around. I spend millions of dollars a year for lawyers and for accountants to do my taxes. In a letter filed in court by the New York Attorney General, Mazars USA said a decade of financial statements compiled with information provided by the Trump organization, quote, should no longer be relied upon. Trump Trump used those statements to secure loans and to sell his business success as he ran for president. I was a business guy. I was successful. I was very successful. New York Attorney General Letitia James is trying to force Trump and his eldest children to testify under oath as part of her investigation into whether he illegally inflated the value of his assets and sought to avoid paying taxes. The Trump family dismisses the investigation as politically motivated. New York prosecutors come after us every single day on these political witch hunts, trying to find anything they possibly can. And that's all this is. In a written statement, the Trump Organization downplayed Mazar's decision, but this could have big implications, Kira, for multiple investigations into Trump's business practices. Well, John Carl, thanks so much. Coming up, we are going to the happiest place on earth with the Super Bowl champs. I know you know where that is. And welcome back. So glad you're streaming with us. Uh, Super Bowl champs, you probably know by now, it's the Los Angeles Rams. And they celebrated at the one place that you always go to when you win the big game. I, I, you know I don't even have to say it. Kaylee Hartung caught up with several of the star players. Here you go. Their Super Bowl win. The stars of the Rams and their families celebrating the victory. Where else but Disneyland? You know, this has been incredible. Being the happiest place on earth with all our fans here. Just an incredible experience. Thank you guys so much. Has anybody slept? A couple hours. I got an hour on the couch. Cooper Cup, the Big Games MVP, after connecting with his QB Matthew Stafford for the dramatic game-winning drive. I just got a lot of trust in this guy to go do his thing and. Uh, you know, that's what that's what makes it easy for me at quarterback to just put the ball in his area and he makes the right play. Aaron Donald in the defense sealing the win as the clock ran out. You got to be relentless. You got to try to find a way, give everything you got to, you know, trying to be a world champion. We stood up, we made plays, and we need to make plays, and we're here now. The raw emotions on the field turning from tears to pure joy. The pictures of this will last forever, but what do you want your kids to take away from getting to experience this moment with you guys? And I feel like a kid with, the, with this whole experience right now, man. Just, you're just taking it all in. Man. It, it, it's, it's been a, a truly a long journey to, to get to this point, so um, we all blessed to be here, all happy, and get to share this with our family. The Rams winning their first title since the team moved to L.A. in 2016. Aaron, you were a Ram before the team came back to L.A. How have you seen this city embrace you guys and celebrate this win? Fans just hugging us with open arms, man, and, and to see where we started to where we at now, man, and through the, um, the ups, the downs, the good years, the bad years, man. Like you could say, mission complete. Stafford, after 13 years in the league, under Super Bowl or bus pressure, getting the job done in his first year in L.A. Well, L.A. feels like home, that's for sure. You're also grounded by your families. What credit do you want to give them for allowing this moment? You talk a lot about the sacrifice that it takes to be able to get to this place where you, you win a world championship, and not much is, not enough is spoken about how your family makes those same sacrifices. They know it more than anyone else. They know it because they have to live it. And Kira, the celebrations do not stop there. The Rams are going to host their victory parade on Wednesday near the L.A. Coliseum. Let's hope those guys get some sleep before then or not. They are living in the moment and enjoying every minute. Kira. And it's well-deserved. I think you had a good time, too, Kaylee. Thank you so much. I'm Kira Phillips. The news continues with all the latest context and analysis right here on ABC News Live. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.